Heart rate up, adrenaline up, stomach muscles spasming. Overbeck's in distress. Look at these methane levels. Methane? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, it's in my mouth. Hey, he who smelt the Delta. Oh. How are listening people? Hello. You're listening to Spit and Posh Presents Pictures Power. I am one of your hosts, Ryan Swinski. And I am Bartek, also a host. Hello, Bartek. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm doing very well. We're we're approaching the the endish time, or have we by the time this episode gets released? I think this is going to be released on the thirty first. So endish time of twenty nineteen. I'm looking forward to and the tw- decade twenty twenty. Now we have to analyze the identity of the twenty tens because when we started the unappreciated masterpieces, it was all about the two thousands. Uh, fidget spinners. It was all about fidget spinners. Yeah. That's that's what <laughs> in the that 2010s. one year. <laughs> no 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 no. <laughs> That's the whole identity. Fidget spinners and Donald Trump was president. That's the identity. I did literally watch a video about fidget spinners yesterday. There you so go. The timing. <laughs> Bam. We are doing a show of Pictures Power, the show in which we cover a movie that has come recommended, whether it be from Bartek, myself, or the listening people. Now, Bartek, we had a listening people suggestion from, I do believe, Nick. And also, this is one of these movies that was suggested to us from people we knew for when we were doing Unappreciated Masterpieces. So this mm. is also like a, a, a catch-up episode for Unappreciated Masterpieces. We're still going to do it in the Pictures Power Hour format, but this is also like a, we didn't get to do it on Unappreciated Masterpieces, so we're doing it now. Literally it got on, recommended, and it's like, yeah. I feel like we should do it. On IMDb, one of the recommended films for this one was uh, Heavyweights. Exactly. So we're doing the film Rocket Man from 1997 with Harland Williams, different to the Rocket Man, which is the biopic on Elton John, although both are named after the same song. Yeah. Of course. I really, yes. Uh, And this movie is a movie made by Disney, which is something I was shocked by. I didn't realize that. I'm glad they got permission to use that Pinocchio song. Exactly. Uh, Well, Bartek, let's get into our juicy history with this film, Rocket Man, if we have one at all. Do you have one at all? No, no. In fact, usually I watch film like a day in advance. This one I've watched maybe five or six hours in advance to this episode, mm-hmm. and I did not know what it was about until I like looked it up. Okay. Yeah. So. So I saw the poster. I'm like, oh, okay. So there's gonna gonna be a guy in a rocket. You were right. <laughs> You knew at least Harlan Williams was in it. I mentioned that last episode, and he was in Sorority Boys. You mentioned someone from Sorority Boys was in it, and I just took a stab, like, oh, maybe it'll be the tall one. And it was. It was, the tall, goofy one. And it was. Yep. (laughs) Different to Michael Rosenbaum. Yes. He was just goofy. I don't know if he's that tall. But uh, my history with this film is this is one of those ones that I had not seen before doing it for this episode, but I had heard about it it's one of these things in which people recommended it but also outside of that i remember just you know it's one of those things where you just hear about movies but i didn't even know the plot i hadn't seen any footage from it it's just i knew its existence was there as one of these children's entertain family children's entertainment movies about space nasa that's what i kind of my history with and then i heard harlan williams was in it and i'm like ooh, and a leading man role Ooh, okay what kind of guy is he going to play i thought he was going to be more of a more of a, a mischievous character more of a more of a dickish kind of character because i'm used to harlan williams kind of playing sleazy self-serving type of characters like in sorority boys I even though yeah. he's a bit dumb in sorority boys he is doing a you know a pretty selfish act in that movie yeah. i only know him from sorority boys and freddie got fingered so this was a different one and freddie got fingered of course how could we forget that great scene and freddie got fingered mm-hmm, the the hospital scene Yes, he was in that, wasn't he? Yeah. Yes. I just I mostly remember him in like he was the... making he was joining in in Native American chanting <laughs> and making weird sounds in it. Great actor. Unlike this film. Unlike this film. No monkey sounds. No monkey sounds. <laughs> sorry, sorry, chimp sounds. Yeah, exactly, monkey bone. Uh, so here's something I want to say. My understanding of what this movie was going to be before watching it was very different to what we got. 
I saw one of the posters of him in his astronaut outfit, and it was all swollen at the bottom area, like he had farted in it. Mm. And I thought that we were going to get a movie that had a lot of farting, and I thought it was going to be somewhat similar vein, space, farts, rockets, chubbyish kind of dumb main character to the film Thunderpants yeah. that we did on the podcast. And I thought, ooh, we're going to get an American kind of fart comedy kind of thing, and Thunderpants was a British fart comedy, and I'm like, ooh, it's not going to have the charm of Thunderpants. That was my immediate worry. It was like, it's going to be a fart-based comedy. It's not going to have the charm of the farts in Thunderpants. And luckily, this film didn't actually contain that many farts, and to the point in which I kind of wondered why the advertisement for this film. I watched the trailer for it afterwards, and I saw some more promotional... F- Images really emphasize that this is going to be kind of a movie with lots of farting in it, or all kind of toilet humor of that variety. There is toilet humor in this, of course, but yeah. it's not like that. And I don't want to dissuade anyone. Thunderpants's fart humor is creme de la creme. It's it's charming. It's sweet. Give it a watch. Listen to our episode. But I thought I was going to walk into a movie in which we get like a dumb man child who's kind of simple and he's farting and he kind of has like a Patrick smash kind of thing from Thunderpants in which he's kind of enlisted into NASA because of emergency circumstances and he farts and he's kind of like a bumbling fool. And I kind of got that somewhat. Yeah. His qualifications were genuine. It wasn't like a mistake or anything like that, which and he, would be typical of a film like this. And he did beat out the other person qualified to be an astronaut or almost qualified to be one what was your expectations going into this the film's title is rocket man and you know the guy from sorority boys is the lead but what did you i I forgot that until i saw him i'm like oh of course ryan said that this guy was in it um yeah i only had the poster i found to go off of and i think that poster was just like his face i think it was like like a caricature of him in a rocket looking out of the window making a funny face so i Looked at that and I was like, oh, okay, so this is going to be, you know, a, a, a silly comedy because, you know, they're using this caricature art style mm. um, and it's going to be centred around, like, this actor is going to be the main focus of the comedy. And that's what it was. Um, I kind of had, I, I honestly, kind of some low expectations. Like, I thought, like, oh, this is an unpopular one. This is something we would have done on unappreciated masterpieces. So maybe... Yeah. Maybe, you know, there will be some merits to it, but I could, I could see easily, you know, why it's not a good film. Um, but I was surprised by it. I, I had a decent time with it. Actually. You did? Yeah. I was wondering how you were going to feel about it. I was like, I'm what's not, Vartek's going to... I'm not insane about it, but I did have one or two scenes where I had some out loud laughs. So I yeah. can appreciate that incredibly. This film did deliver some laughter. That is that is a true statement. I, I immediately started laughing when I saw that Shelley Duvall was in the movie. <laughs> and I was like, What? Wait, where did she come from? She's uncredited. I, I was thrown off because we only just did The Shining, and there there she is, and she's blonde, yeah, and it was guess, like, hey, it's Shelley Duvall. Guess what name I also saw in the credits that we saw recently? Go on. In stunt performers, I think Vern Troyer was the first one listed. Yes. So that's two in a row for us. Vern, you're back, baby. Well, no, I think he would have played the chimp as a stunt, but I don't yes. know. Who else would you, there be? You do, you do you think? Or, or, maybe, the or maybe, maybe the kid in the washing machine. I don't know. Baby, all maybe he was everyone's stunt person. <laughs> uh, so yeah, you you seem to enjoy this movie. You're not cuckoo crazy bananas about it, but do you think if this was a movie that you had watched as a kid, you would have loved? I reckon so. Yeah, I reckon I would have liked this as a kid. This is a Disney movie. Let's not forget that Disney they make things for kids. Yeah, this wasn't Touchstone Pictures. This wasn't Touchstone. This wasn't that filthy old Touchstone. So, my experience of how I felt about this movie, I think, is perfectly encapsulated in an IMDb review I found Mm -hmm. for the film. I actually grabbed a couple because I got down that rabbit hole, and I thought, I'll I'll read a couple. So, I'll read I did look up Roger Ebert, so that's an old Did he give it a 10 out of 10? He he gave it 3 out of 4. He really liked it. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Take that, Full Metal Jacket. (laughs) <laughs> um, so this is a review from 2005, so it's not that long after the movie had originally come out. Yeah, you know? eight years? Yeah, eight. Uh, it's called 10 Out of 10, This Movie Is The Best! With so uh, many exclamation marks. Um, this is so retro for us. <clears throat> yes, it is. Uh, the, mo- the review starts with... <clears throat> 
believe me, this movie is the best movie ever! I've watched it, like, over 20 times. That's right. 20 times. It is the best! I fully recommend it. It is for sure a clean, family, fun film. And it's very funny. The bummer thing about it is that it is out of print. Arrgh! Walt Disney, if you ever reread this... <laughs> Please froze it. will be up soon. <laughs> Please give it to us on DVD. But it is almost at all the rental stores, though. Hey, and if you do get a copy for keeps, just remember, some people are selling the movie for $100. Hope I help you all out. Have fun watching it. That was very much my experience watching the film. I felt like, argh, and it's the best movie ever, and where is it on DVD? And you want to talk to Walt Disney? <laughs> Walt Disney, if you're hearing this and reading the transcription of this episode, argh. <laughs> um, no, I'm joking, of course. I fucking hated this. Um, <laughs> are you shocked, really? I think one of the things is a lot of people will look at our back catalogue of unappreciated masterpieces and go, what, well, Ryan, if you could like something like Christmas with the Cranks or Deck the Halls or Thunderpants. Why can't you like a movie like Rocket Man with someone you like, Harlan Williams, made by a reputable, reputable, reputable film distributor like Disney? Why don't you like Rocket Man? Well, I think the main thing is with a lot of our unappreciated masterpieces that we covered on the show, it has the same atmosphere as this. I don't have a problem with actually what a lot of this movie is doing. My main problem is Harlan Williams' character. Because, for me, he never learns anything. Mm. At the end of the day, he doesn't he doesn't do anything different. He doesn't change. It's And it's not one of those movies in which it's we've also done where the main character doesn't, doesn't have to change. It's the people around them that have to change. Um, the people around him barely change either. Um, they change their opinions of him. Barely. Yeah. And I don't buy their change of heart for him. And I found him to be extremely odd as a main character. I found there was a lot of conflicting information through the performance, through what we've been given, and just through the tone of how this character should be. Is he a kind-hearted idiot genius, or is he a mean, nasty, mean-spirited jerk? Is he crazy? Is he smart? Is he dumb? Like, all these things were very conflicting for me. While a lot of the time in Unappreciated Masterpieces, I find that the characters that are similar to this have more of a defining character trait or defining personality quirk, or a defining theme or arc that they go through, as well as the characters around them. You could look at all their scenes and like say, oh, this makes sense for this character, whereas for this character here in this film, it was just like, oh, whatever would make it quote-unquote funny in the scene, I guess. Yeah, it changed from scene to scene to scene of what we needed him to be. He's the kind of guy who's going to sacrifice his life for a chimp, who only exists in the movie so that he can do that at the end. Yeah, that was something I noticed too. <laughs> um, and and that's the thing. And he's my main. He is my main problem. A lot of I have a lot of other problems, but he's the main. He, that main character, and I don't want to blame Harlan Williams as a performer. He's really giving it his all. But maybe if there were, the director had a stronger hand and a stronger vision of where this character should be, at what level he should be at, um, I would have been more drawn. I felt that also maybe if they harmonized the child performance with what his performance was. Because when we meet the child... He's like wide-eyed. Yeah. And he doesn't seem... There's no way for me to go around it. I'm going to say this word, and I know it's a very taboo, taboo, taboo word for modern day standards. But meanie pants, retarded. Mm. Uh, he came across very retarded as a grown up, and the kid didn't come across as a retard. Uh, but as a full grown adult, I just kept thinking, well, this guy's really retarded, and there's no, and I do mean it in the mean spirited way. Like I did not like this character. And he came across very retarded. And I don't apologize for using that word. Um, it is the apt word to describe him as an adult. The kid didn't perform in that fashion. 
And I didn't believe from the get-go that that kid grew up to be that man. Mm. Immediately was thrown off by the movie, by that. As soon as we get introduced to Harlan Williams as a grown adult, he's driving that wacky car, and he's wearing those bright orange trousers, and he's just... (laughs) And he's falling over, and he's making noises. I didn't believe that that was the same person. I was waiting for that moment in which we heard that he got, like... Hit on the head. Oh, like, yeah, brain damage. Or, or like, you know, he shoved a crayon up his nose and it never came out like Homer, right? Hmm. But I, I just got lost with him. So You got the Simpson gene. And since he's in every scene, practically, I fucking hated this movie. Um, I didn't like him. I didn't like him. I don't blame Harlan Williams. I blame direction and script. Sure, Harlan Williams is to blame as well because obviously a lot of it is improvised. You can tell by watching. There's a lot of improvisation. Uh, that's not to say that there weren't things I didn't in, didn't enjoy. I want to talk about the positives because you clearly enjoyed it a lot more than I. Mm-hmm. There were a lot of gags that I did enjoy. I really liked when that guy he injured at the very beginning with the demonstration of how the, the his program does work, and the guy gets hit in the face. Proving that he was wrong. I like that. I can't remember which character, but there was someone who quipped later that that he injured himself proving himself wrong. (laughs) It was a great line. Um, I also really enjoyed that when he did fall on the ground, we got a first POV shot of him looking up at the other people. And then Harlan Williams looks down and his glasses fall off his face and fall onto the camera. I thought that was a really clever little physical gag. Mm. It, it did feel like, oh, jeez, he's hitting me with his glasses. I thought that was a, a, a genius little different way of doing a shot like that instead of just like a wide shot and we see the glasses fall on the face and the, and the guy on the ground be like, Aah! So I enjoy little things like that. It's always a pleasure to see respected actors getting a paycheck. I respect uh, Bo Bridges turning up to get a paycheck. I respect William Sadler turning up to get a paycheck. I like the fact that these actors got money. <laughs> <laughs> I like both of those guys. William Sadler, of course, is uh, Overton. Overton, was it? No. Uh, some of the names have escaped. Bill. Me. Bill, yeah. The astronaut man. The one who's death from Bill and Ted. That's death. Right, right, Ted, right. Who's also the villain in Die Hard 2 who <laughs> does naked Tai Chi. So you said the, the one who's deaf. I'm like, was that a character quirk I didn't notice? <laughs> he He's deaf? What? <laughs> How's he an astronaut? And I like Bo Bridges as an actor as well. Bo was Bud. Mm, he was the one that gave him the medal, yeah? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I like the that character. The Deus Ex Machina medal, yes. Um, I, I didn't like his character. God forbid, Bart. Like, don't don't accuse me of that. I like Bo Bridges. I like the way he speaks. He's a brother of Jeff Bridges. We all love Jeff. I've always loved Bo. I always thought he was an. Un- I've always thought he's an underrated actor. Um, other things I liked. I like that we got Elton John's Rocket Man at the end credits. That was nice. Um, the cinematography. It was in focus. Uh, I will say this. I was actually with the movie for quite a while, and then there came a point in which I uh, I I stopped being with the movie, and you know what I mean by that, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can pinpoint it, and then I thought like, oh, I lasted quite a while with it, but then I looked back at it again. I'm like, oh, I didn't last that long, <laughs> and it was exactly the moment in which he started having a one man show with sock puppets that he made in that isolation chamber. Mm-hmm. Um, that's when I stopped being with the movie and I looked at it and I was like 15, 20 minutes in. <laughs> I never got back with it. I never got back with the movie after that. I don't think there's any real comedy points after that moment that I was like, yep, that's a thing I enjoyed. What about you, Bartek? Tell me about what you loved about this. What were the laugh out loud moments that really got you? Um, so, not necessarily the puppets, but the, the isolation chamber sequence I did enjoy. I liked the, the whole twist of, like, oh, I see how this is gonna go down. It's gonna be that he's gonna keep himself sane by being insane, I guess, and that's gonna screw over the other guy. I found that quite funny. But that's not even how it went. Uh, That's how it seemed when I was watching it, though. But when they open it up to see him, 
in there talking yeah. to socks he's also looking as crazy as the other guys so. i know yeah well the ending of it obviously didn't play out the way i was thought but the the way it was playing out i'm like oh i see what they're doing there that's kind of funny the way you thought it was going to play out because yeah. at the end the way i was thinking as it was going the way you would have done it would have been better is what you're saying okay it's like they both come out and one of them's like gone crazy one of them's like oh what's wrong with him even though he was the one screaming the whole time yeah um and the other one was when it did get around to the fart thing I liked the the mission controls realization of why Bill's uh, vitals were up. They're like, oh, he's his heart rate's up. This thing, this thing. I'm like, oh my god, what's going on? They mentioned the methane, and then they just realize he, that you know he, there's been a fart, and they start laughing. I found that funny. Uh, of course you did. I um, hated that. <laughs> I, I, when they all started laughing, and I timed it, they laughed for eleven seconds. It was a long laugh. It was yeah. a long laughing time, and I was just like, <laughs> he done dung farty. <laughs> I hated it, but you loved it. Good for you. Again, the initial impact. And I remember also in the in the, in the, the childhood scene at the beginning when the fat dad walked in carrying a football. I'm like, I think I know what kind of character this is. And then he literally says, like, oh, why can't he just play football? I like how you imply you had a character. Like, Well, that's, again initial impact i thought like oh i know what this character is now he's gonna be you know the the i love that your <laughs> positives are things that you thought the movie was gonna do and they didn't even now come I... close to doing <laughs> now that i'm saying it out loud yeah but i did I, you know i did laugh at least <laughs> i laughed at a setup that didn't have a payoff to what i thought was going to be good he wasn't rip torn in it from, from got, got fitting it. he was just in two scenes i think and yeah. that's generous that's a generous amount. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, this movie, um, I can see why it would have been done on unappreciated masterpieces. I can see there's elements of this in which it's got that real kind of silent comedy slapstick element where you could watch this without sound on and you would still get, like, what's going on and there's an enjoyment in the physical performance. Um, he overdoes it for me. But, uh... uh <laughs> yeah, he he overdoes it for me, but I could see for children who watch this and have grown up, they have a sentiment towards it, as we did with certain movies. We did on unappreciated masterpieces. I think for me, I just needed more, and you know, this is a problem. I'm an adult watching this. I need needed more of a thematic narrative threading throughout the movie to really get attached to these characters. As soon as we met the woman in the film, yeah. and I'm not going to give her a name because that's what she is. Forget what the character's name is. She is simply have. the <laughs> woman in the film. She exists to be the woman. The moment you see her, it's like, oh, she's against how he is now, but how is that going to be the case later on? And, and we don't know. Um, I honestly don't know why she turned and liked him. Because stars. Because he danced. Stars. Mm, stars. And sung. And they sung and did. But, uh, that's something where it's like, oh, she's the lady. She's the woman. She exists purely as that feminine object in the movie that the masculine object in the movie can be attracted to. And thus, thus the audience feels like they have both as individual characters and as a whole developed because they now like each other. I like how you said feminine object and masculine object because this is about a Disney film. We can't say penis and vagina. I didn't even mean it like that. I meant like they're I not know, even good enough to be characters. They're like things, just like physical objects that you just... They're like chess pieces. It's like watching someone put together a jigsaw puzzle of like, okay, this scene needs to lodge here, so we need this jigsaw puzzle piece here. Does it all flow together? No. But... Uh, they could have ended up as best friends in the end, but no, they had to dance. They had to dance, and William Sadler had to shine a light on them and get a little kiss from the chimp. That was his development. He got a romance with the chimp. That's true, and I read in the trivia that the chimp was played by a female chimp. Yeah, I thought, too. Did you think this at all? When we got told at the very beginning there's two candidates that we have for this project, we have... This guy, we've already tested him before, and I think we could test him again. Or, oh, and it cuts to Harlan Williams. I thought the, and then they have Harlan Williams meet the chimp. I thought the chimp was going to be the guy he competes against. I didn't think it was actually going to be a human. Because they just said, like, a first name, like, whatever the guy's name was, Greg. 
And I thought, oh, okay, oh, okay, it would be really funny. We could have a stupid comedy set piece in which they're testing this guy against a chimp. But in the end, it was just another guy who only failed this test because of Harlan Williams and the fear. And so why did he fail the first time? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, I do, I do, yeah. So how come he failed the first time? Was Harlan Williams there too? We need a prequel trilogy about him. (laughs) (laughs) Prequel trilogy. (laughs) In which they make a perfect photorealistic CGI version of him because Mm. that act is too old now. So, Ryan, you brought up the idea that, like, the chimp could have been the competition and that could have been, you know, a comedic part of the film. Mm. Um, but they did set up like, oh, this is your roommate, which was another setup that they that went nowhere. Didn't really go anywhere with no. Oh, uh, we saw the bit where Harlan Williams had a sock puppet that they claimed to be a monkey binding his hand, and he threw it around the room in the background of that one shot, and that was supposed to be like their rivalry relationship set up, so that later on in the movie. When the chimp steals his sleeping pod, we can be like, ooh, they already have this bickering relationship. But this that, that scene was also after when he sang the lullaby to the chimp to show that, like, they're getting along. Yep. See what I mean? It's like, I wish that the movie could just be more decisive. Have the monkey and him have a dickish relationship, or have them have a friendly relationship. One extreme or the other, but they want to have it both ways. And same with Harlan Williams' character, who I refuse to name, by the way. I don't remember. I don't want to remember. It's Randall, right? Fred Randall, I think. I don't care. He's, he's Harlan Williams. Harlan Williams is the lead character. He's like the monkey and the, the chimp in the relationship. One scene, he's friendly and nice. Another scene, he's a jerk. Another scene, he's an innocent buffoon. Another scene, he's retarded. And another scene, he's a genius. It depends what the film wants him to be. But I will, I will defend it. The film primarily wants him to be annoying. Yes. <laughs> For sure. And I'm not saying that as a negative. That is objective truth. The film wants him to be annoying because everyone else finds him annoying. They want the characters to be annoyed by him, yes. And that's part of the comedy. Yeah, yeah. Yep, comedy was in this. Uh, Yeah, I just... It dragged on. It's not the worst thing I've watched, obviously. It's just there. You could very much tell this was one of those throwaway Disney projects. And I brought that review up at the beginning as a joke, but also to prove something of... In 2005, and there's some reviews later in which they're still asking for a DVD and Disney just didn't put it out or haven't put it out. I haven't checked if they have by now. But you can just tell that this is one of those Disney projects in which they had a quota to meet. They had to put out this many films. They had to have a film at this for this demographic at this time of year to be released. And this film is just one of those films in which I could see someone being offended by it or loving it. For me, it is a film that exists. Maybe, maybe, um, did, was Elton John the one that did the music for The Lion King? Mm-hmm. Maybe this was, like, the compromise. Like, I'll do the music for The Lion King if you make a movie, like, named after one of the I songs. I love the idea that you think Elton John's <laughs> the one that's making the compromises there, <laughs> like, demanding that they make a compromise. Not he has to make a compromise of... I really want to do songs for you guys. I'm like, okay, you can do song for Lion King, but we've got to be able to make a movie with your ti- one of your songs as a title. And he's like, okay. Well, Ryan, who do, you, who do you trust more, Elton John or Disney? Neither. <laughs> so one is the pinball wizard. <laughs> so I'll trust Elton. Oh, that's true, yeah. He is a pinball wizard. Yeah, I just didn't like Harlan Williams in this, uh, his character. I just found him so annoying. I was, like, the one thing I really got annoyed too by is they introduced what could be interesting comedic plot developments and just plot developments, and they don't do anything with them. Like, you used all of our food to make paintings on the walls. Now what are we going to eat? Who cares? (laughs) Who cares? We're moving on. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Like, what do you want? The chimp and him are going to be roommates. We're never going to see him. Okay. Uh, she's a geologist. We're never going to see her do anything with that. I fucking didn't even know that. Yeah, that's why they had her getting the fossils. But in the end, William Sadler got them. The guy's not a geologist. Uh, and it's... That was the setup for the chimp as well. Like, oh, this chimp's trained to find these rocks. And... He didn't. 
Well, he took he, uh, Bill he took, took the chimp. Yeah, but but we didn't see the chimp do anything. No, so. Bill just walked straight to the rocks because they had already been there before. So why did he need the chimp again? Like they had already been there the day before. That's where they met her when they were having their fart hijinks. So I'm talking about on Mars. I am talking about on Mars. Were they on Mars for two days? Oh, they were. Yeah, they that's were, right. dude. That's right. They were supposed to be there for like a week or two, but then the storm came. Yeah, that's right. They stayed overnight. I remember now. Yeah. See how memorable it was. <laughs> um, Mars exists in the movie, and the I, I was, and real life actually. I th- <laughs> the god? No, he doesn't. <laughs> um, I was so thrown off when it's like at twenty three or seven years later, and it's like, so wait, is this set? In like in what was the modern day 1990s or is this set in the future of where the 1990s was like uh, what did they realistically think we we're going to get to mars in 1997 when they were making the movie that's the thing i think about <laughs> these are the little things that i think about like no, i don't i don't care about that but oh i, I do I because <laughs> there's nothing else to care about in the movie we don't get to know who his parents were. We just know Shelley devolves in the movie for a paycheck. Oh, I, I didn't mention her. I respect that she got a paycheck. Paycheck? Hello, I'm Shelley Duvall. Um, dude, it was just there. It was just on screen. It made noises. Um, I hated any time he sang. I was really, really, really worried. You're going to be like many of the IMDb reviews where you're like, one of my favorite scenes was when he sang, I got the whole world in my hands. And I was just going to look at you with disdain if you said <laughs> that. I was really fucking scared that you were going to say one of your favorite scenes was when he sang something. No, I, I didn't find it funny. <laughs> wow. That's really, really, really bad. Then. I found it hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Five stars. What was your experiences watching this? Honestly, I just... I, I didn't... I, I knew that, like, the characters found him annoying. I personally wasn't annoyed by it, but, again, like you said, there wasn't a consistent characterization. So, at first, I was kind of like, um... You know, he's not fallen into this situation out of him, like, you know, misunderstanding. Like, he is actually a genius at technical stuff, so they want to compromise that to put him on the mission. I thought, like, oh, maybe you can have something with that. It's not going to be, you know, cliche, like, oh, mistake. So I thought that was a neat setup, but again, didn't really matter. They could have done it either way. Um, I guess there was a sort of adventure, like progression going on with the film like now he's in the rocket going on there was consistency there but again i don't know i'm i'm pulling things you're pulling man again i i didn't hate it but i i'm not too you know crazy about it one of the things i think that the uh, film gets wrong and a lot of american films get wrong when it comes to more modern american films especially the 1990s and 2000s the idea of the bumbling buffoon lead character. Yeah. We see this in this movie, but I raise it as a clear example in another movie, the Mr. Bean the movie. I was thinking When Mr. Bit. Bean was a movie, and the Americans didn't understand how the charm of Mr. Bean as a character in those British episodes, and this film has the same thing in which... You can have, you have to have a consistency. The thing about Mr. Bean in the show was there was a consistency. He was dumb. He was mean. He was a nasty little man. He was a cheater. He was a swindler. He was like not a nice dude. There's a Christmas episode in which he gets dumped by his girlfriend because he's just too much of an asshole. But he's too dumb to realize he's an asshole. Mm. But one thing is, he's never smart and he's never caring. Like, he only cares about himself, Mr. Bean. He thinks he's smart, too. He thinks he's smart. He only cares about himself and Teddy. And Teddy is him. (laughs) He doesn't care about anyone else. And then the American movie, Mr. Bean, they make him a part of a family and he cares for kids. When I think of the TV show, and I can think of so many times in which he screws over kids with no remorse. And that's this movie. They don't understand what they want. Do they want him to be this charming, bumbling buffoon who thinks higher of, higher of himself and he isn't? But then the movie's like, no, no, no. He's actually better than everyone else. 
So I lose sympathy for him then. I lose any connection of, oh, he is actually smarter than everyone else. Oh, okay, if you're going to make it that he's smarter than everyone else and he's too much of a dweeb to be relatable to these other people, make him relatable to me. Make him relatable to me, at least. And then I can be on his side. No. But Ryan, he doesn't belong in NASA. You don't belong in NASA. Mm-hmm. I saw many comparisons to to the film Major Pain, in which I did you think of it a few have, times, yeah. you know, this kind of character who's very, like, of a certain way, and they're thrown into a wacky situation. In Major Pain, the thing that humanizes that character is his relationships to the children and to the woman in that movie, too, and the and her child, and the child. And this movie doesn't have any of that. I don't buy his relationships in this. I don't buy it with the woman, with William Sadler, with with Bo Bridges. I didn't buy it. I didn't buy it. There was this point too where the the lead guy on the NASA project, not not the black guy who reminded me of Duncan from Big Fat Liar, but uh, uh the 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 one with the eyebrows, the little black eyebrows, the one who at the end was like, "It's my call. You fucked up. Go home." Yeah, yeah. The yeah. one who was like, "I follow protocol." I did not understand. Maybe you could explain it to me. Why was he batting for for Harlan Williams? Why was he always on his side when the rest of the movie indicates that he would be against Harlan Williams? He's always for protocol, always for sh- getting things done, ship and he, shape, and he, and he and becomes like an antagonist towards the end. Some for yeah. no reason. Why is it that he was always on Harlan Williams' side throughout the whole entire training and journey and selection? I just thought of it as like. You, the scene where he he proved that like the the machine wasn't his fault that it wasn't working and like he pre, I, I basically just thought like oh because that scene left a objectively good impression of Harlan Williams that that would be why he accepts him but okay. it's just that simple I guess I think the film screws up there too I think they have they should have had Bo Bridges be that character who bats for him but Bo Bridges doesn't bat for him until near the end of the movie because for the first half he doesn't like him until out of nowhere they have the scene in which he's like here's this medal and Harlan Williams is being a jerk about it there's that see that's the thing like Bo Bridges is such a down to earth kind of guy. He's giving this speech about all these medals, and here's this one, and I give it to you. And Harlan Williams is like, <laughs> "Okay, thank you." And he's like, "A simple thank you, blah blah blah," would be what. Uh, however, that scene goes, and it's just like I could just see Bo Bridges. Just that was just his genuine reaction. I could just see that being true. Like any moment in which they could have had a more sincere, touching moment with Harlan Williams, they decided they didn't want to do it for the most part. <laughs> They think, oh, him and the stars. That's like him looking at a star and choosing and making it called Fred Star or whatever it's called. Mm. They think that is like, that's enough. That's not enough, dude. That's not enough. <laughs> and you could have these unlikable slapstick characters. I see a lot of people compared to Stan and Ollie, Lauren Hardy, Abbott Costello, Three Stooges. You know what work about all those dudes? Most of their material was short. And a lot of the time, like Three Stooges, when they did feature films, they weren't as good as their their, their eight minute shorts. Just saying, in and out. But I'm stuck with Harlan Williams in a rocket for eight months. Did it feel like eight months, Ryan? Because they cut it. They actually cut through the months, if you remember. I actually did remember, and <laughs> it felt like I was there every second watching him paint food on the wall. That was another thing, too. Yeah, I thought that that, when that was introduced, like, oh, no, he has to wait out the eight months, I thought that was going to be... The rest of the movie? The the conflict of the film. No, there's no conflict, dude. That's the problem. There's a storm. I think that that's a conflict. I also really got annoyed when they introduced, like, oh, no, the monkey knocked the tubes over, and oh, laxative tube. We didn't really do anything with that. We didn't even get, like, a joyous poop gag. We got more of a joyous... He flushed himself down the toilet because he dropped the metal in there. We didn't get any kind of funny, you know, set piece that you would expect from you introduce a tube of laxative and someone eats it. Mm. We didn't even get to see the payoff. Yeah, the the only thing... In fact, all it did was set up another setup of, oh, he has to be in the toilet and something happens there. And he drops the metal and it comes out blue and then he, the president... And he starts singing, I got the whole world in my hands. 
it was so weird. And I thought, oh, he's going to give the laxative to William Sadler. And William Sadler's going to shit himself talking to the president. And it's going to be really embarrassing. But no, he gave him hemorrhoid cream and it did nothing, really. He just washed it out and then it was fine. Yeah, two of them just got something yucky. and Yucky? Was Hers like... was toothpaste and she reacted like she got arsenic. So here's the thing. Here's the thing. <laughs> I was watching the film from a bit of a distance from my computer, so I didn't initially read what it was. I thought someone would say out loud what it was. They did say out loud. They did, yeah, but she was like, woof, 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 so I couldn't understand it. So I had to rewind and see what it was. So initially I was like, what could he... It was something that like some sort of liquid anesthetic or something? But yeah, no, I thought was, so too. It was just toothpaste. Like, just, phew, that's And it came out like foam out of her mouth. Yeah. Now, maybe that's space toothpaste. I don't know how space toothpaste works, but it was so confusing. And she's reacting like, oh my God, you've poisoned me. And I get it. Like, eating a fuck ton of toothpaste cause it doesn't taste good, but like, I don't know. It was so weird. What did they think it was? They thought it was meant to be potatoes or something? Yeah. yeah. It was. I don't know what they meant to think it was, but I don't care. It's just little things where it's like, okay, you want the gag, but you don't want to do the work to get to the gag. Oh no, he's using his underpants as the flag. Oh boy, the president sits in that Oval Office. My favourite piece of trivia was that they built a really good (laughs) Oval Office set, but never got to show it off because they only used tight shots. Hmm. Why? (laughs) They had the money. That's the movie. They had the money. Elton John gave them some. Yeah, yeah. Anything else you wanted to say <laughs> about it? I didn't like it. I don't know. I didn't hate it, but I'm not too fussed about so it. So, recommendation? No. If you got kids. Bartek. If you don't find contemporarily annoying characters too annoying <laughs> to handle it. I've got some other pieces of reviews, if you'd like to hear them. Sure. The next one I have is just called... Is 9 out of 10 stars. It's called, Put It On Loop And Drive Yourself Loony. You got that? For eight months, yeah. This came out in 2000, so keep that in mind. Before the other one. This is nearly a decade ago. Yeah, almost 10 years. Almost 10 years. (laughs) No, it's almost 20 years ago now, being silly. Um, I don't have 2020 vision yet, but... <laughs> no, yeah, almost. Just a few days. Um, I worked at a video rental store when this movie came out on PAL slash VHS. And as we were only allowed to show PG-rated films... <laughs> sorry, I don't know the US rating in brackets. Um, anyway... I slapped this film on to see what it was like. I had trouble serving customers. I was laughing that much. I put the film on loop for my whole 12-hour shift and nearly drove myself loopy. I sang along to He Held the Whole World in His Hands and later found myself talking to my socks. I don't work there anymore. (laughs) That's the end of that review. (laughs) And then the last one I have is... um. From 2006, it has spoilers, no star rating. It's called Ha 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 Blast Off to a Funny Film! Disney's 1997 Rocket Man. Oh, can I just say with the Rocket Man title, I really don't like. I know it's there for a reason, but I really don't like that the M is capitalized when Rocket Man's one word. Yeah, I saw that some places apparently separated the two words, but even when they didn't, the M was capitalized. Don't like that. Don't like that. It makes it feel like it's wrong. Okay, so um, 1997 Disney movie, Rocketman, is a very funny film about space exploration. I guess. Here, a boy's dream really is to know. go out to out to is to go out to outer space. He spent most of his time looking at the Earth when the father won- wondered why he should be like most boys playing the footballs and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> In brackets, lol, I remember that. Well, several years later, this man ended up going to NASA and started training for space. This was hilarious as evidence from the isolation chamber scene, in brackets, he screamed, John Jacob Jingle, over and over again, scaring the other man to death! (laughs) Finally, this man was selected to go up to the Mars, and the rest. I will leave hush hush so that you can see yourself. 
Rocket Man may be for, maybe a forgotten film now, but it's a great one. Watch it. You won't be disappointed. Did you agree with their <laughs> summation of um of that? Did I agree with objective things that happened, <laughs> but in a very awkwardly told way? <laughs> Some of it wasn't true. It didn't scare him to death. Did he? What scene was he talking about again? The isolation chamber scene. Like he makes it he... sound like he killed the guy. <laughs> no, he didn't scare me. Even me, who was wrong about what was happening, was more accurate. I found myself looking up Harland Williams. Like, how much stuff has he been in? And then I got onto his IMDb quotations. Now, these are quotations that he has made that have been put onto IMDb. Sometimes on IMDb they give um uh like personal sayings or whatever personal sayings quotes like quotations that have been taken. Sometimes they give context. Yeah. Like they have little brackets. These are all different series of quotes. I imagine from a stand up routine, but we don't have context for that. So I like so to imagine this is him being quoted at a presidential dinner. So none of these are like from his films, are they? No, these are actual quotes from Harland. Okay. Now, like I said, we don't have context. One would like to imagine they're from stand-up routines, but um, we don't know that. They could just be from a presidential dinner. <clears throat> these are all individual quotes, but I'll read them, rattle them off as all together. Sure. Did you know that pumpkins are the only living organism with triangular eyes? Did you know that rhinoceroses are just big, fat, white trash unicorns? Did you know that you can't throw away a garbage can? Did you know that the elbow meat is the exact same texture as an 86-year-old woman's nipples? Did you know that KFC is just one letter away from being one of the rudest words in the English language? Those are his quotes. I didn't realize the pumpkins had eyes. If you cut them out to be jack-o'-lanterns. And, um... I just really thought we needed to hear some of those from Harlan, just to remind us what a genius he is. When he's not acting, he, he's he says thinking. the truth. He says the truth. He's a philosopher, if you will. Yeah, and he or shares. as the Americans call them, sorcerers. Sorcerers. Style, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you and I. If Harlan William was in Harry Potter... His, what... head, his head is a chamber of secrets. Serious. You know Harry Potter a little better than I do. Mm-hmm. If Harlan Williams was in the movies as a character... What character would he be best suited to play? They can make Fred and George triplets, Fred, George, and Harlan. <laughs> Seriously, who do you think he would be? Of an established character? Yeah, of an established character. Not like your fanfic character. <laughs> okay. Fred, George, and... Harlan Williams. And Barney. Um, I... The immediate one's coming to mind is like Gilroy Lockhart when he goes crazy. You and I are so close... I thought he would be great as Professor Quirrell. Mm. <laughs> that bumbling, stuttery, play- like, <laughs> and then reveal that they're actually more than what they are. He should be every defense against the dark arts teacher, even when Snape did it. Yeah, even when <laughs> Snape, him as Snape would be amazing. But only for one film. Did you notice how Canadian Harland was in this movie? A lot of sorries, and he's supposed to be American. And I know he's Canadian in real life, and I'll give that a pass, but it was very, very, very noticeable at points how Canadian Harland Williams was in this those feature film. Those weren't Canadianisms, those were him doing chimp noises. Of course, of course. How could I forget? Take that, Canadians! Yeah, especially you French Canadians. Uh, they sound more chimpanese. Well, that, don't, don't they make fun of their French Canadians? But, anyway? but we can make fun of them too. <laughs> You're on a different... I don't want to feel left out about making fun of French Canadians. You're on a different hemisphere to us. You have to sing at a different time. So, Bartek. Yes. That was Rocket Man. Mm-hmm. A very quick, brief conversation about it. It is a very quick, brief movie. I do thank those people over the years that have recommended it, though, and to Nick for suggesting it. I don't want to come across as negative as I have in the whole episode. Like, this is a film I understand that is very much loved by certain people, and I understand that it has merits. I could see uh, the slapstick physical comedy could really be great if it was in small portions, but as a whole feature narrative-driven film, I felt like if it leaned more into just being pure absurdism with not even trying to have a plot, something along the lines of Rocky and Bullwinkle comes to mind, where that film has a very loose plot, but they're more like, oh, look, he is... um, he is, um, what are they guys? The Good Burger guys. Keenan and Kel. Yeah. Here they are. Jason Alexander's here too. Yeah, if you had maybe like, 
like all those other films that I really like where they have a lot of, you know, you meet a bunch of wacky characters along the way. If this is more like Bubble Boy. And that's the thing. Bubble Boy, Thunderpants. And all those things. Apocalypse The now. main character has something we can latch onto. Yeah. I buy the relationship in Bubble Boy. I buy it because we spend the first half hour of that movie. But that's that movie. We've already reviewed it. Uh, unfortunately, I don't recommend this. I do have a one of, like I said, thanks to all the people who suggested because I do see, even though I have a lot of hatred and disdain for this movie, I do see why there is a fandom for this movie. I do see it. It's just not something I'm a part of. No, I think you were very fair this episode. I don't think you. I think I was fair. I, I think, think when I, I think you're a dick. I think when I stated at the very beginning, I fucking hated this episode. Of course I would. I mean, this movie. Of course I would. I think I was very fair. Uh, Bartek? Well, you weren't lying. Final thoughts? <laughs> I already gave them. They're, they're done. His, his thoughts are final. I did. Like, if you have kids, you know. If you have kids. If you're not easily annoyed by annoying characters, mate, you might like it. I had, I look, I laughed out loud a few times. There's merit to that, but it doesn't mean I have to love the film. So, Bartek, next episode is a you selection. You select Me a movie. Select she. That we cover last time. You did Tokyo Godfathers. Mm-hmm. That was Christmassy. This next one will be into the new year of 2020. Yep. I imagine you're going to be picking a movie that involves this being the year 2020, hopefully. No, <laughs> he looks like Craig <laughs> does it. Yes, it's not the first black and white film we've done. Oh boy. Yeah, I, I um I haven't told Ryan what it was yet, but I like uh, I censored out the name so he knows the characters in it. It's a two-word title with two letters then four. I don't know, dude. Black and white, you you gotta you gotta hit me. So I think what's it's, the film? I believe we both like this film, Ryan. We are doing the uh, the year escapes me, but it's a '90s film called Ed Wood. Ed Wood. Oh, yes, cinematic classic. And uh, barring any unfortunate things, we have a guest lined up for that episode. Ed Wood himself, Ed the Wood ghost himself. of Ed Wood. <laughs> Oh, good. I love Ed Wood. And, uh, I do too. The same guys who did Ed Wood did that Dolomite Is My Name. It seems like those guys who did the script, mm. really, uh, their career is just doing adaptations for scripts of people's lives who were in the film industry. <laughs> so mm. that's their life. I think they did the Larry Flint movie as well. So Ed Wood, oh boy. So the Tim Burton movie. Some argue his last good movie. His last truly great movie. And also... One of his most undervalued movies, even though it got an Academy Award for Martin Lander. Mm. So I guess, you know, next episode, listening people, make sure to check out Ed Wood, Tim Burns' Ed Wood. You can just watch Ed Wood's actual movies if you like. <laughs> well, we'll certainly bring them up. I mean, the film looks at them. It does. It does. And I've watched some of them. I don't know. We'll discuss that mm. next episode. I've seen I... some too. Woo-hoo! I have a little collection at home. So do I. I'm at my home now. Woo. No, we're at the studio. The studio is my home. Uh, I live in the gutter. In the suburb of... <laughs> so, uh, until next time, listening people, remember to be kind to each other. You can rate and review us on whatever podcast platform site allows it. Very much appreciated, especially as we enter the new year. New reviews would be very much appreciated. Hint, hint. You can follow us on the social medias of Facebook and Twitter, Spin Posh Presents, where we're posting questions, some funny images, following up on some comments we made in our episodes. As we record this recently, we did our Mystery Box episode on tender love and care. Mm-hmm. Have some fun stuff on the social media that further explores what that thing was. I didn't realize that they made 50 Cent Blood in the Sand. <laughs> the creator of that made a 50 Cent video game. Fun fact, a video game where it has a whole button dedicated to swearing. 50 Cent? <laughs> you can just press that button anytime you want and he'll say a swear. A swear. Mm-hmm. Um, so there you go. Until, like I said, until next time, remember just to be kind to each other. Enjoy the remainder of 2019 and or the start of 2020, depending when you're listening to this. They could be listening to this in 2018 and that would be very confusing. If you're in our time zone, literally this episode will come out like seven and a half hours before the decade's done. So there you go. So, Happy New Year! Rocket <laughs> Man fart. Oh no, he got methane Rocket in the suit! Rocket Man scene. farting all the, everywhere. It would have been great if they ended with the William Shatner version of Rocket Man. Oh yeah, he does have one, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah, the, it's infamous. It's an infamous cover. Oh, the trivia said that there was a reference to Kirk. <sighs> great. And so that made you love the film. 
He's from Iowa. <laughs> yeah, that was the reference. They both, <laughs> even though Star Trek had, no, I don't want to get into it. <laughs> How many <laughs> fart jokes did the that series have? Star Trek? The, 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 the Kirk era. <laughs> if we're talking about the animated series, one too many. 